Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&A. Looks like there's quite a few questions, so I'm just going to jump right in and not waste any time. First up is a question from Alex Shamai, and it's a question I got a lot after that Xbox video that I recently uh, released, the one how to connect your Xbox to an HDTV. Uh, and Alex is running into an issue that a lot of other people were, in that certain TVs don't adjust the black levels correctly to what they should be for the Xbox. And this is both in interlaced and progressive scan resolutions. Um, and in reading through what people have commented on in the video, and people like Alex who took the time to really go through everything, it seems like some TVs are able to manually switch what the black level mode is, and others are not depending on certain circumstances. So the TVs that I use, you could just set the black level to whatever you want and you're done. Others, you need to set it to PC mode to kind of force it first because it goes by the EDID data that the HDMI signal is sending out. Um, and others, you just can't at all because of the converter. The converter that goes from component video to HDMI isn't telling the TV one way or the other. Um, and, you know, I guess if it were a more robust converter, you could have those settings. But that's also why they're $20 converters because they just do the basics. So... In those cases, I don't know if there's any real fix for that at all, other than possibly to switch to an open source scan converter, which, you know, that's an expensive solution because now you're going to have to get Xbox component cables uh, or a good component solution and then the OSSC. I think maybe waiting for some of the internal HDMI mods that are probably coming in about a year, um, you know, if you have the ability to wait is probably best unless it's something that really bothers you. And that just goes to a personal preference. Like for me personally, if I'm playing on a CRT with composite or R whatever interference is on the screen doesn't really bother me because it's just interference over what's already supposed to be there but that weird effect you get when like with those crappy cables that for super nintendo and genesis that treat 240p like 480i that weird shaky interference really bothers me i don't know why it just does and i don't think there's a right or wrong answer so if the black level thing really bothers you you got to find a way to either switch your tv's mode find a different converter or I guess, you know, try to uh, just figure out a different solution overall for the Xbox. One of the uh, a common response to that video was, this is dumb, just use backward compatibility. And they're right in that if the game that you want to play is backward compatible, then it would be a great solution to just use the Xbox 360 or Xbox One. But if your game is not backward compatible, then it's, you know, a moot point, I guess. Um, also, Alex said they had a jail bar issue in 480i, um, and changing specific capacitors didn't seem to do anything about it. You know, there's there's a bunch of different revisions of Xbox motherboards out there, and I am by no means an expert in each. Uh, back when they were kind of like mainstream, um, I, I modded so many of them, for all for Xbox Media Center, XBMC, which has now evolved into a bunch of other amazing projects. But uh, other than modding them, just to flash it and get homebrew running I didn't really have to do too many mods back then because you didn't really need to you know at the time it was just component video s video and composites all anybody would have needed so just use that and be happy uh, and with CRTs and stuff like that you didn't have to worry about black level settings at least back then and the equipment I was using so unfortunately I don't have many other things to offer at this time hopefully the the team behind the chimeric adapter might have a solution in the works or might have suggestions or anything like that but it just kind of comes down to what I talked about, about setting your TV to the right settings if your TV has the ability to do so. So sorry for the, the mostly useless response to you. I, I just, you know, tried my best to, uh, uh, to kind of put it into perspective, but I don't think I actually have a solution. And I'm not sure that there will be one, at least in the short term, with the equipment you already own. Bad Reality wanted to know about using light guns on CRTs that have flat glass in front. So sometimes you hear them called flat tubes or, or even flat screen CRTs or something like that. Uh, and I showed a video where I had one that absolutely worked fine. Uh, that was both, it worked with light guns both before and after the TV was RGB modded. Uh, but the question was one that was posted in the, the video itself in that um, supposedly if you have a flat glass CRT that doesn't work with light guns, you could turn up the brightness and contrast and it'll start working. I don't know if that's true or not, and I no longer have access to any flat glass CRTs, which is why I never responded, but my guess would be no. Um, my guess would be anybody that 
tested that. Probably had a flat glass CRT that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't, which is something I, it's very common, uh, especially if like like in duck hunt, if the duck is in the center of the tube, it'll work. But as it gets closer to the flat edges, it won't anymore. And I think it has more to do with reflection of light than anything else. But that's just a guess. If I have the opportunity to test on a flat glass CRT again, I will. But to be honest with you, my personal collection, I'm concentrating only on curved tube CRTs. Uh, and the only way I would pick up a flat glass one is just if there was like a a specific model that I wanted to try. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave this one up to other people to test. Um, but I, I'm guessing that the brightness and contrast thing is not true. But I could be wrong. I'm never, I never try to claim to know everything. This is just my guess. Blackguard wanted me to throw out some more support for consumer grade TVs with component video inputs and using something like the HD Retrovision cables or the RetroTINX RGB to component uh, converter. Um, to be honest, I have been flying the flag for that solution since the moment I started Retro RGB. Uh, the only thing that I've kind of modified a little bit is, you know, one of the hardest things about doing stuff that talks about how to get the best out of is you immediately get a bunch of people that assume that's all I care about. And in fact, that's what a lot of trolls really love to talk about is uh, anybody that, that says you need a frame meister is just an elitist and nobody that I'm friends with has ever gone down that path. The only thing that we try to say is, hey, here's a solution to make it better. So for me, I've modified this in saying that any CRT is a win, period. If you're playing consoles from PS2 uh, and, you know, and maybe even GameCube earlier, then you cannot go wrong with a CRT. No matter what resolution it runs at, 480i, 240p, whatever, it's a win. It doesn't matter what input it's at. You know, unless you're in a, uh, an apartment building in a busy city, even RF is a good choice. You know, if you're out even a little bit away from other wireless networks, you can get RF to look just like like composite and it's super easy but you're right i completely agree with you uh, agree with you black card in that um, you can get a very high quality solution doing that um, and i try to tell people you know I, in all of these things that i talk about if you want to have a really authentic and awesome experience on the cheap grab any crt you could find however the, the more inputs and the more variety of inputs the better um, so I, I do try to emphasize all of that these days, but for me, I just, if I had to choose one, it would be more important to me that, if, uh, that people listen to the fact that any CRT is an awesome classic gaming experience, you know, especially if you can grab one for free or for 10 bucks or something. So who cares if the geometry is off and, you know, it doesn't work perfect, whatever. It's the cost of getting into it. I think that to me is more important, more important of a point to get across than, by the way, you could have some something that looks very close to a low-line PVM with a component input. I think that's a really great thing to talk about, but people's attention spans are plummeting as every year that goes by. So I think that's why you may have heard me speak more about just CRTs in general rather than that. Uh, and I also want to make sure to, that people don't think that it's okay to spend $300 on some you know, 13 inch consumer grade TV with component inputs. There are so many scalpers and just horrible douchebags out there that don't care about anything other than taking money from you. And I get, I get a lot of flack every time I talk about this. I have just a wave of people come after me saying, you know, everybody that sells something isn't a scalper. If, if I'm not being clear, I apologize, but I just, it, it really drives me nuts when I flip open Craigslist and I see a bunch of cool CRTs for like five bucks, 10 bucks. I always forward them to my friends that are looking for them. And then inevitably there's always one or two that says retro gaming monitor, component video inputs, $300, or even just an RF only TV, you know, perfect retro gaming TV, $200. And it's like, you're, you're just a scalper. <laughs> so I, I just, I don't want people to misunderstand me and only go hunting for those component TVs and then let these scalpers think that they're really worth hundreds of dollars when they're not, because it's still a consumer grade TV. You're never going to get perfect geometry. It's, you know, probably 20 to 30 years old, if not more. So you're going to need to do a recap and some maintenance on it at some point. Um, I mean, you could say the same about RGB monitors, but if you drop 500 bucks on a mint RGB monitor, knowing that two or three years from now, you're going to have to recap it. That's all 
part of the game. It's like buying a car. You have to expect maintenance. Whereas paying all of that money for something that's going to require, even depending on the TV, might be more effort. So that's kind of why I'm just dialing it back on that stuff. But you're 100% right. I'll try to mention it as much as I can. Uh, and if I ever move to a place that's bigger than a closet, I'll have all of these things sit up so that every time I show demos like this, I could just wheel over uh, you know, a consumer-grade TV with component inputs and show that on camera. Um, and I guess if I find one super cheap, like a 13-inch, I'll pick that one up as well. Um, but generally, the smaller the more expensive they get because you could ship a 13 inch CRT pretty safely, but not so much a 20 inch or bigger. So people tend to charge more for those. And they also kind of have to charge more because, you know, you never know if the box is going to get rolled down a flight of stairs and then you're, you're out whatever you paid for it. So I kind of get it on that side, but, you know, it's still something that would be 50 to 100 bucks for something that I could get for free if I just waited long enough. So uh, hopefully I didn't ramble too much and I put that correctly into perspective. Kelv SYC wanted to know if some of those consoles with a hardwired composite video output can be modded at all for better video output, or if the only way to get them to work on a flat panel TV is something like the RetroTINK 2X. And while I haven't opened up uh, all of them, a lot of them just use a basic system on a chip that only outputs composite video. It's not like something where you could, you know, where it's outputting RGB, which gets re-encoded to composite video, where you could just tap that signal. Um, I think it's something that kind of always sort of comes out composite. Um, now, I haven't looked at all of them. I'm sure there's some that you could mod. There's some clone SNES consoles that I've seen people RGB mod. But overall, I think I would just, I think it's infinitely easier to just use a RetroTINK in that case. Um, and also the quality of those vary greatly. Uh, I think some of the first, like, I saw a Sega Genesis one that was pretty terrible. I saw, uh, well, I mean, infinite Atari ones that were pretty terrible. But I've also seen some Atari ones that were actually pretty cool. They worked fairly well. I mean, they're not they're not any hardcore enthusiast choice, but if you grew up with Atari and you just want to spend 10 minutes playing one, yeah, I mean, that's you can't really beat those for stuff like that. And, you know, it, but the bigger difference in many situations is plugging composite directly into a flat screen or flat panel is often something that's not going to be a great experience. Processed wrong, lots of lag, whereas composite through the RetroTINK 2X into a flat panel could actually be a decent experience. So for me personally, I'm not really going to spend any time looking into that any further. I would just say that if you're into any of those, even kind of the good ones that you think might even be worth owning. I would just go the retro tink route, unless you're somebody that already knows how to design circuits, how to probe around and find video signals. And you know, if you want to do that for fun, fine. But I just I don't think it's something that would create a big modding scene around. Now I could be wrong. You know, for all I know, those Atari consoles or in television or whatever could have a a whole you know upcoming scene that I don't even care about yet. But uh, I just kind of think it's one of those things where if you really do want to use them, you might as well just use the easiest solution, which is still going to give you as good enough of a solution as before. 8% Android wants to know how they could use their new arcade stick um, with the Sega Saturn. It looks like they got a Victrix Pro FS, uh, which I think uses all Sanwa parts, so it should be a, a pretty darn good arcade stick. Um, and you're currently using it with the Mr. and the PS4. So... There's different ways that you could try to get it working with the Saturn. I think I think there's USB to Saturn adapters out there somewhere, and that would probably be the best way to do it. There's definitely Neo Geo to Saturn and Saturn to Neo Geo out there as well. So if you wanted to use like the video I just posted about direct modding um, an arcade stick, you could probably add a DB15 connector and just direct wire it up to the Sanwa buttons. Once again, just don't plug them both in at the same time, but that would work. But you're going to have to look into some kind of conversion. Um, and Brook, uh, Rafnet are probably the first two that come to mind. Uh, and the other thing you could do as well is look into modding it with an MC Cthulhu, which is the same basic theory as modding it with direct RGB in that you tap the buttons, the shared ground, you put an output connector on it. And I believe they have an, um, a cable adapter that allows you to go direct from that to Sega Saturn. Uh, and those, if you're going to do that, you might as well look into doing DB15 as well. But, you know, 
I think try the adapters first, RefNet and Brook, just to see. And if they don't have anything out there, you're going to have to look into modding it, which stinks because very often, you know, something should exist that just plugs in and works, but doesn't. You have to end up cutting something and installing it. But hopefully at least I pointed you in the right direction. Silent Jet wants to know if I know the reason why most optical drive emulators require removal of the optical drive as opposed to just installing something that either auto switches or you install a switch in it as well. And I think the answer is space. And I think the answer is when they're created, people were more thinking about replacing broken drives and stuff like that. But I agree with you 100%. If there's ever a choice between buying an ODE that allows me to keep the original drive or not, I'm always going to want to keep the original drive. Now, for me personally, it's because I use these consoles to test and make videos and do research for all the other developers that are making stuff for these things. So for me personally, I need all the functionality I can get because I need the abil I need to ha have the ability so that if somebody emails me and says, hey, can you test this? you know, disc on a Sega Saturn or something. I'm kind of just making stuff up at this point, but I have the ability to do it. However, if I was a collector with a large collection of CDs and, uh, you know, stuff that meant a lot to me, it, I would probably want that as well. Um, I just think it's something that people haven't spent a lot of effort on yet, but I think enough developers have heard that so that they're probably going to look into this stuff. Um, the one that's already out there, of course, is the SD loader for the Neo Geo CD. Furtech has already come up with a way, and I believe Retro Game Restore also came up with a different board so uh, that allows you to do exactly what you said. You could kind of mount the SD card elsewhere, and you could switch between using the optical drive that's built in um, or the SD card. And I think that one might even... I, I may just be remembering this wrong, but I think the SD loader was even looking into stuff like, uh, or Furtech was looking into stuff like, you always boot to the SD loader, but one of the options is press a button and it accesses the CD, so there's no switch at all. It's all through the controller. Uh, I don't know if that's possible or if I'm remembering that wrong, but that would be my choice. I would always rather have something that leaves the internal CD-ROM intact that doesn't require any cutting at all, even if it means you're going to open the top of the console to get to the SD, I'm fine with that too. Uh, I'd much rather have that, and I'd especially like it if it was no switch. It was just you do it all through the controller. So hopefully developers are listening, and they'll start thinking about that for future ODEs. Jason Guffey has a PS2 that they're using through an OSSC onto a flat panel TV and isn't really happy with the look of Bob D interlacing for the 480i only games. Jason's setup doesn't really allow for a CRT, which would have been probably one of the best choices. That way you could use the CRT for 480i games and then use the OSSC for everything else if you wanted to. Uh, so that would have been a good solution, but that's also very common. People don't have the space or the time for CRTs. So Jason was looking for a different way to get around uh, the Bob D interlacing. Um, now, the first solution that I want to offer to you is update the OSSC's firmware and try all of the different options they have now. Um, I went on a long rant the other week about how much I really liked the RetroTank 2X Pro and SCART's new uh, alternating scan lines. I liked it a lot more than Bob D interlacing, and I totally didn't even realize that they were added to the OSSC a while ago. I don't know if I didn't pay attention because I, I don't normally pay attention to scan lines. I don't really like fake scan lines. Um, or if I just, or if no one made a big deal about it or what, but I just, totally forgot they were even there. So I would check that out. And I believe there's other types of deinterlacing that that offers. Um, and on the other side of that as well, you could look into something like one of the RetroTink products or Rad 2X and use the, uh, the smoothing filter. And that's something that I felt made a huge difference. Um, you don't, cause the smoothing kind of blends everything to together. So you don't see that weird jumpiness of Bob D interlacing. Uh, and I believe there's an alternate firmware for the OSSC that could offer something like that as well. I don't think there was enough room in the FPGA to keep those features as well as everything else. So uh, I would try to spend some time researching. It sounds like you already own the OSSC, so I would look into that first. Um, and if none of the OSSC-related solutions are good enough, maybe try to find a friend with a retro tank to borrow to see if that'll work for you. Um, and if so, that's probably going to be the best option. Um, However, you did have an idea that isn't really uh, an easy thing to accomplish. Uh, but I do want to address it because a lot of people talk about this stuff. 
your idea was to take that 480i signal, downscale it to 240p through you know an Xtron or TV1 type of device, and then scale that from 240p through the OSSC back up to HD resolutions, thereby completely removing the flicker because now you're having a progressive scan image and you would lose some detail, but it would be worth it in the trade-off. Um, so that doesn't really work right. You could do 480p to 240p, which completely defeats the purpose in your scenario. But all of the ways that I've tried myself to deinterlace 480i to 240p never worked as good as you would hope, and certainly not something I would use all the time. Um, and you know, I think there's other ways out there. There are ways that work with uh, on CRTs, but won't really work with digital displays because of the way the signal is. Um, it does get kind of confusing, and it's something that I don't really know if um, if it's feasible. And if you're going to put that much time and money and effort into something like buying all that stuff, another thing to try would just be maybe mod your PS2 um, or, or get one of those boot things uh, like the boot memory cards to try to force certain modes. So maybe you could force 240p or force 480p in certain games. Um, or, or you could possibly even look into buying a different type of deinterlacer. Um, I don't know which ones are the best for gaming. I just had a conversation with Fuda a day or two ago about um, different deinterlacers for TV shows that I know have game modes, but I don't know if that means it switches to Bob deinterlacing as opposed to it. But uh, I just, in my, my personal opinion, in your situation, while it was a good idea, I don't think downscaling to 240p through a, a, a separate box is going to be the best way to accomplish what you're looking for. I think try the different solutions for the OSSC, try the RetroTINK smoothing, uh, and then if, you, if none of that is good enough, then maybe look into modding your PS2, or at least looking into compatibility lists to see if the games that you want to play can be forced to progressive resolutions. Um, and also, thank you very much for uh, you know being a new Patreon subscriber. Appreciate it very much. Um, and hopefully I was able to point you in the right direction. It's a Serial WoW wanted to chime in and add some more information to my talk about using Mortal Kombat arcade boards. Um, and It's a Serial WoW added a bunch of info that I totally forgot to talk about. Uh, so anybody that's interested, please read through the post. Um, you know, you don't have to be a Patreon subscriber. You could just look at the YouTube window if you happen to be listening audio only. Um, but the basics are you got to make sure that the sound board matches the main board. So you can't just buy an MK1 main board without a sound board and then go on eBay and buy a sound board and expect them to work. You need ones that match. Uh, and you also need to make sure that some arcade boards have a video signal that's off spec and won't work with certain TVs. Um, now I see this mostly with scalers and I see certain BVMs that freak out and have like that weird sync issue up on the top, but I've actually had really great luck with using all four MK boards on all the different CRTs I have, including consumer grade TVs. Um, so you know, great points. Uh, I probably should have mentioned both of those. Um, and also the MK1 soundboard uses negative five volts for power. I forgot to mention that as well, but if you're using an arcade power supply, that's already there anyway. But, uh, I mean, getting into arcade boards at all is, is just a whole other diving down a rat hole of craziness. Um, and I really think it's worth it for people that there are no alternative solutions out there. Um, I, I'm very happy that I bought my MK boards, and even if I don't use them as much as I would like to, they're, I'm going to keep them forever. Um, and it just makes me smile every single time I play it because I do love the game, and using great emulation would be good enough if I had a fast enough PC that could have a frame or less of lag. I think I, I would be fine with that. It's just something to me personally about being able to play a real Mortal Kombat machine on any of my displays is awesome. So... Thanks for chiming in. Bad Reality had some questions kind of regarding the Nintendo leaks from uh, last week that I talked about, as well as uh, FPGA cores in general. Um, and there's stuff that I kind of know, and then there's stuff that's that's more opinion, so I'll, I'll at least spit out what I'm pretty sure that I know. And that if you reverse engineer something without any kind of um, inside info, uh, kind of like back in the day where uh, I think it was Electronic Arts reverse engineered the lockout chip for the Sega Genesis, um, and they were able to make their games on it legally because you couldn't 
I mean, they didn't uh, they didn't use any proprietary Sega stuff. They made it all themselves. And I think FPGAs fall into that category. Now, there's certain patent laws and things like that 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 are definitely out of my my full scope of understanding. Um, but certainly for consoles 15 years older or older than that, um, I don't think you could it would ever be considered illegal to reverse engineer and make a core of it. And even for more modern consoles, which while not really feasible on FPGA, even things like emulation, I don't think anybody would have to worry about legalities of that unless you used something that was stolen source code. Um, but th you did make a point in that what's the point in le leaking private information when it could never be commercially used? Um, you know, that's it's just one of these weird things. I mean, I think... I just think it's an awkward situation and I just, I, I don't really know how to respond to it properly. I mean, I do, I do think stuff like this, like for example, if the, the source documents for the original NES were leaked, the Mr. Core for the NES is pretty damn perfect. And it would be kind of cool to look through those source codes to be able to see, oh, you know, we got this 99.9% .9 right, but let's, you know, fix these two bits here or something. I think that would be cool. Uh, I just don't know how I would feel about somebody making like a brand new GameCube out of the stolen code. Um, and I think at the end of the day, all that would matter to me is who's losing money from this. Um, and also, alternatively, I guess, are the wrong people making money off of this. And it's just, you know, if you if you were to break into Nintendo servers, steal the code, make yourself, a, you know, an, an FPGA-based N64 and sell that, I think, in my personal, just an opinion, but I think that's way different than somebody who says, hey, there's source code out there, let me use this to make an open source FPGA core that everybody could use. In my opinion, those are two completely different things. Legally, they're probably the same thing, but you know, legal and moral are, are never, are very often not the same, I guess. So I don't know. I'm not sure how much more I could uh, comment on this. And I don't know if my thoughts on any of this stuff would change based on any more information I get. So I know it's kind of a cop out answer, but at the very least I could you know, answer your other question in that I'm pretty sure any kind of reverse engineering that's done without any proprietary information is totally legal. There's just certain things about what you do with that information that might be an issue. So I'm assuming you would never be able to use logos and trademarks and stuff like that unless they expired. But uh, I'm pretty sure people working on Mr. aren't going to worry about Sega coming after them for making a really awesome Genesis core. One more question from Bad Reality about uh, different kind of legalities of stuff. A remaster of Super Mario 64 for the PC has been made using the original source code, but compiled for PC using DirectX. When a remaster of a game has been made using non-plagiarized code, is it illegal to play and or own said game? Um, for example, if I remake shot for shot Star Wars, is it illegal for me to spread my version freely and is it illegal for viewers to own and watch my content? So while I'm not a lawyer, I've spent an unhealthy amount of time on the phone with lawyers over the years for different tech related stuff. So the, don't consider this official legal advice, but some, some very strong suggestions are that if you're the creator of any of these things, you're always in the crosshairs to get sued. Um, and somebody who rebuilt Super Mario 64 from scratch and hand drew all of the assets and wrote it all in assembler or something like that, um, even though you know that's 100% original, you're still using intellectual property of Nintendo, so you could still get sued. Um, now, on the opposite end, is it illegal to play and or own said game? You know, this is another one of these things where it's you know, if I buy a Ultra HD Blu-ray of one of my favorite movies, but I don't like using discs, I just want to rip it to MKV and have it instantly start. That is illegal. You're not supposed to do that. I am breaking encryption. Now, I'm using an example. Yeah, there's backup laws. Let's just skip this to make my point here. You know, it, it, ripping something for your own use is very often illegal. You have to use illegal tools to do it. However, I don't know a single case in the history of time that anybody has ever been sued for using something and not distributing something. So people have gotten in trouble for downloading that that's one thing. So I don't think that happens as often anymore, but people have certainly gotten letters saying, you know, you've illegally downloaded this TV show or this movie or something, please stop. Um, but I think the, the fear is in distribution and creation of these things. So, you know, if you had 
just once again, just an opinion based on based on life experience here. Where you know, if you had that Super Mario sixty four uh, PC version that was compiled with out of original code, if you have that on your PC, if you even if it would be considered illegal, I personally would never ever worry about somebody coming after me for simply having it on my PC. However, if you sold that you burned it onto a disc and you know made a really nice print copy and sold that to people then yes i would i would pretty much guarantee you were going to get in some kind of trouble for that so you know i guess that's just kind of um a general rule of thumb and stuff like that is if, if you're going to go down cr the creation route using somebody else's intellectual property whether it's the, just simply super mario a hand-drawn copy or actual code you're putting yourself at risk to get sued whereas if you just have this stuff there's really no basis to sue you because what have you done with it so once again not a lawyer but that has certainly been my experience and that experience includes an ungodly amount of time on the phone with lawyers throughout my different companies over the years. Jake Lancaster had a good question. They stumbled across those universal CRT TV board replacements on Alibaba. And what a lot of these are are essentially the same as like arcade chassis for arcade monitors, but with consumer grade stuff built in. And they're not quite universal because they also have to match the neck board. If it comes to the neck board, there's only a specific amount of tubes that they could be used for. So um, Jake's question was, has, any, has there been any talk in the community of producing something similar, but with, you know, full input support, RGBS, uh, component video, S video and all that stuff. Um, so there's been some kind of uh, talks for this, but it's really complicated because of the exact issue before. You would have to make different versions for different tubes, then you'd have to support all of that. And I don't think it's a sustainable project, to be honest with you. But I do love the thought of it. I love the, be able, the, the thought of being able to buy a board, buy a power supply um, that's you know brand new with all super high quality capacitors and components on it, really high temperature stuff, um, and then buy a separate neck board to match whatever tube you have, and then plug them all together and have yourself, you know, basically like rip the rip the board out of your current consumer grade TV, plug this one in instead, and then have that as a replacement. I would love that. I just think, from the knowledge that I have, it would be really complicated to be able to interface a new neck board for all the different tubes to that main universal chassis. Um, but, you know, there are things like, uh, like Tim Worthington was talking about making his newer um, RGB to arcade output conversion. And you could technically use something like that converted to go direct to a CRT. And that's something that you would want to use for your own personal project. So I don't know. I mean, the stuff like this is definitely over my realm of design ability. Um, I would love to talk to people about doing that and the feasibility of doing that. And for all I know, maybe the most common 20 TVs out there only share, you know, five neck boards. I, I don't know that information. Um, or in, And I also don't know what's what would be different about a lot of the chassis between them. Would they have to send completely different signals or could you send raw RGBS and then just have whatever components are on the neck board change it? I really don't know, but it's something that I would love to look into. Uh, and I, I would love to see somebody come out with kits like this as well, because I think that would be a, a much much easier and more worthwhile solution um, if you had the like if I had a choice between um, buying a consumer grade TV opening it up discharging it reading every single capacitor writing down the value going on digikey and finding every single replacement for each taking the time to replace them then putting it all back together and then you know versus just buying a chassis and everything that matches you know open it up discharge it pull the other ones out plug the new ones in and you're done I think more people would be comfortable with that, and I think it would be less effort overall. And if you factor in time, possibly not that much more expensive. So great idea, but I don't know if it exists yet or if it could exist. Retro Gaming Boombox uh, was watching the Saturn ODE video and saw that I'd mentioned the FRAM mod and wanted to know where to get the chip. Um, I didn't specifically put any links because I don't really know. Um, there's a newer version of the chip that's like 20, 
twenty dollars or more each, which is really expensive. Um, and I don't know if it's a hundred percent compatible. It should be. The pins should match up. Everything should be fine. But I didn't want to link to that both because of cost and because uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure if it would work. Um, but also, I think you could still find the older chips on eBay. I would just buy like a lot of five, not a single one, uh, which should still be fairly cheap because uh, a lot of times you get fake chips or chips that were repurposed where they take them out of other devices, um, you know, respray them so they look brand new, but don't test them. So you could buy five and four could work and one couldn't. Um, but I would love to see somebody determine a drop-in replacement that's more affordable. And if anybody does, definitely contact Luke from Console 5, because if you're absolutely sure it works, if you could, you know, provide proof, maybe also let me know and I'll have some friends test it out. Uh, I'm sure Luke would, would buy them in bulk and stock them to save us all some trouble and some money. So sorry about that. I don't know a, a good, reliable place to get one now, but hopefully we could change that. Connie had two questions. Uh, first, I mentioned mixing chemistries in a previous Q&A. Would I be able to provide a brief, a brief explanation about the subject and maybe or link or two with more information? So I don't know enough about this to confidently go into the different chemical analysis of each, but there are general rules in tech like don't mix metals. So don't use, you know, hard gold connectors in a, a brass receptacle and stuff like that. Um, you know, don't mix certain types of flux with certain types of solder. Um, and I think if that's something that you're into or something that you're worried about for a project that you're working on, I would search specifically for the project that you're working on. So cartridge connectors and cartridge slots, solder versus solder paste and stuff like that. Um, I, I, it's kind of, I don't have a specific link I could provide because it could be different based on scenario. So I'd really just research that exact in-depth thing. Um, and the, the second question is what would be a good and reliable way to measure lag in controllers, especially ones using USB? Um, so that gets really complicated. The best way to do it by far would be to follow the guide on retro RGB and use an oscilloscope. However, um, if you're measuring using USB, you're also measuring signal. So then you would really need to write software and you would have to have some other piece of hardware to measure it on the other end. So that is definitely the best way to do it, but that's not always feasible for every scenario. So what I do is I wire an LED to a controller um, so that every time you press a button, the LED lights. And then I take some kind of game or something, you know, a test software, whatever, where when I press that button, something reliable happens. Now, the way consoles and computers and everything else process their input is different. Um, just in a basic explanation, very often, it falls within one frame depending on when you press that button. So what I usually end up doing, like I did in the Genesis video, the Genesis mini video, that's a great example, is I use a 960 frame per second slow motion camera, and uh, which is about one frame per millisecond. And I do it 10 times with uh, one controller and 10 times with another. Or in the case of the Genesis mini, I did it 10 times on original hardware and then 10 times uh, on the Genesis Mini using a USB controller. Both, of course, had the LED light in. And then, you know, you're also factoring in the latency of your display. Use a very low latency uh, flat panel or especially a CRT would be good. And then even with a one frame per millisecond, you could get within a frame's worth of accuracy. So I guess one would argue that you could use like a 240 frame per second built into your cell phone to do the same thing. Um, but you're not going to get milliseconds of accuracy doing it that way. You're going to get frames. And you could, I mean, you would really have to do it at least 10 times to get some kind of uh, median number. Um, but I mean, theoretically, you could hit the, your button at the exact moment a frame is being started to be drawn a hundred times in a row and add a frame to the measurement each time. Now that's not likely, I'm just saying it's theoretically possible. Uh, so it's one of these things that's way more complicated than saying, you know, hook up this camera and test it. But I'm very confident in my ability to say, this is a very laggy device or this isn't so bad, you should probably be able to use it fine. Uh, and also, of course, testing it that way would test the entire chain. So from button push till on the screen. So 
depending on what you're measuring, um, so like you said, hook up your USB arcade stick to switch. You're also measuring the switch's processing time. Um, so in order to do this test in your specific question, you would have to mod a switch controller with an LED and then, you know, maybe take 10 videos of pressing a button in, in a switch game and then move over to your arcade stick, mod it and do it the same that way. And then that should give you a basic idea. Um, so it's way more complicated. I'm trying to oversimplify it so I don't talk for 20 minutes about this. Uh, but I would definitely check out the guide on the website. And at some point between now and never, I'm going to do a video called What is Lag? to kind of go into this stuff. Um, a little more generalized, but I will definitely touch upon the measuring with the scope type of stuff. Uh, but unfortunately, it usually requires a full test rig to get actual numbers. Pablo Romero wanted to know my opinion on the current best way to play arcade games with analog video output. Pablo used to use a VGA monitor with MAME on an old PC, but maybe Mr. would be better or a Raspberry Pi if there's no getting around emulation or some other. Um, you said you used to use a VGA monitor with an old PC. If you're still currently using that and it works fine, I would leave well enough alone and just enjoy that as is. Um, because, I mean, that's, you know, if you have a solution that doesn't bother you, then that's a perfectly good solution. But let's just assume for a moment that you don't have any any arcade solution whatsoever. Um, I would, my personal opinion would be, if you have one arcade game that's like your top favorite, you know, maybe it's Mortal Kombat or maybe it's, you know, The Simpsons or something, whatever. If you have one board that's your absolute favorite and you're kind of into tinkering, check to see if it's on the Mr. And if it's not, which most aren't, I mean, there's thousands of arcade boards here. And if it's not available on the Mr., I personally would buy that and take the time to restore it and uh, mount it properly, you know, mount it with some some good support so it doesn't sag in the middle. And I would look into consoleizing it. You know, you could get a super gun, a mini gun's great, but there's also going to be solutions coming out relatively soon that are kind of tailored more towards consoleizing, <clears throat> so it's a lot cheaper and stuff like that. So I would do that just to enjoy all the other aspects, not just the game, but the nostalgia, the cool nerd factor, the fact that you're creating something and wiring something up. Um, but if you're not into that at all, or if a game that you love is already on the Mr., that's my first choice. Because even if hypothetically any of these Mr. cores aren't perfectly accurate and they have some kind of bugs, you're still getting something that is doesn't have variable latency like software emulation. So even if you just plug in a USB arcade stick that has a frame of lag, it's always going to be just that. You're not going to have to worry about software emulation lag that's sometimes two frames, sometimes seven frames. You know, that's the thing that kills me because if it's, you know, if it's mostly just one frame of lag, your body will compensate after practicing for a while. It's the variable latency that software emulation often has that drives me nuts. However, if the games aren't available on uh, Mr. I personally would choose Raspberry Pi simply because it's a, a fairly priced way to have a dedicated solution in a box. So, you know, if you have the space for it and you still have an old PC, just as good, if not better, depending on the speed of the PC. But for me personally, I don't have the extra room for more PCs. So having something the size of a deck of cards or a pack of cigarettes, essentially, with an analog output adapter on it, is ideal for me and it's something that i could throw in a drawer or you know double-sided tape to the back of a tv if i really wanted to just keep it out of the out of the way and for me for arcade games uh, just the fact that i get to play them in a way that definitely doesn't suck raspberry pis do not suck for arcade gaming um, as long as it's you know it's something like that it's good enough because the alternatives are so expensive and complicated so just my opinions but you know if, if you're really into it uh, grab one or one or two arcade boards if, if you're really into that. But if you're just really into the games, look into Mr. Solutions. And if it's not available there, get yourself a pretty cool dedicated emulation platform. Or I guess you could share a PC. If you have a really powerful PC, you could do a dual boot scenario, or you could even try to do something where a second HDMI output goes to an HDMI to analog converter and you, you pump MAME through that. I haven't practiced any of that stuff in a long time, but... You know, those are just my opinions on it. And, you know, any solution that that's good enough for you is the right solution. So I would just avoid 
I would just avoid stuff like the original Raspberry Pi or, you know, a Raspberry Pi 2. I would just try to get some of the newer ones like the 3 or 4 just because you do see a speed boost. Kirk said they just discovered the Retro Roundtable and was wondering if there were going to be any more episodes. Um, I don't know. There's no problems. There's no issues. There's nothing. It's nothing like that. It's just the fact that there's five people with five very, very busy schedules all trying to, to get on the same page and talk about the same stuff. You know, I, I from the moment we hit record, I loved doing all of those. But there were many, many nights where I was just so deep into a different project. You know, I'd been up for, you know, I'd been up and working for over 12 hours. And now it's time to start the round table. And it's, you know, from the moment we started, I was super excited. But right up into that, all I could think about is I can't believe I'm doing this today. I'm in the middle of something else that has to get done. So and I think the other the other guys feel the same way sometimes. So no problems, no issues, no drama. It's just that it's really hard for five incredibly busy people with lives and hobbies and, and kids in some cases to try to, to nail down that one time to do it. Um, so hopefully we'll get back at it at some point. But if we do, um, I don't know if we could try to pump them out as quickly as we did just because, like I said, it's a lot of people all at the same time. Um, and also, you know, thank you very much for uh, your kind words. Uh, and just want to give a shout out and hello to Caleb. Keep the younger generation of gamers coming. And uh, just remember, too, just because something's classic doesn't mean it's nostalgic. That's something I'm getting into into a completely different video, so I'll keep this quick. But some of my favorite songs are were made long before I was born. And some of the cars that I loved to drive were made, you know, 20 years before I was born, if not more. And it has nothing to do with how much I like it. So I think a lot of people seem to have this impression that anybody into classic games is just chasing nostalgia. Uh, but I certainly wasn't chasing nostalgia for cars and music. That's just what I liked. Uh, and, you know, your son was probably in the same boat in that probably born after a lot of the things we talk about were created. Um, so if he's into it, it's because he enjoys it, not because it's some nostalgia chase. So I'll get into that in a video series I got coming up that I'm super excited about. I'm just being picky because I want to make these really good videos. But I do always like to make that point to people is, you know, most of the people around a certain age group get into retro gaming because of nostalgia. But the ones that stick around, stick around because that's the games they love to play, not because of some childhood memory they're trying to relive. So good luck to you, Caleb. Uh, you know, hopefully your dad doesn't bore you to death talking about this nerd stuff and uh, you could um, enjoy some of the crazy things that we talk about. Well, that's it for this week. I guess this one kind of ran a bit on the longer side, but I always just say whatever I kind of feel for all of these answers. And sometimes I think some certain things take longer to talk about than others. So hopefully the length or lack of sometimes doesn't bug anybody. But as always, thank you all so much for participating in these. I really enjoy doing them. And if you're new to these Q&As, post any question you would like wherever you, uh, wherever you support in the latest Q&A post. Um, the way these things work gets a little complicated. I can't really go back into the older Q&A posts. Um, and I have to leave comments on, on YouTube. But this really is a direct thank you to everyone everybody that supports. So no offense to anybody else. Um, you know, I, I do spend an awful lot of time responding to other comments on YouTube. These Q and A's directly just are a thank you to all of you. Um, and just a way to interact and have some fun. So thank you all so much for your support. It's what keeps all of this crazy research and development I'm working on going. Um, and hopefully I'll have a lot more info on that this year on some of the, the weird projects I've been involved in. So thank you all very much and I'll see you next week.